Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from Safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, Safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June, and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course, and if you do it before September 20th, you'll get a 20% discount. Go to safeddean.com and sign up now. I'm happy to announce that I have set up my new publishing house and online bookstore, The Safe House, which will be publishing and delivering the best Bitcoin and Austrian economics books worldwide in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook formats. Go to thesafehouse.com to buy my latest book, Principles of Economics, as well as the Fiat Standard and the Bitcoin Standard. And now I'm also publishing Fiat Food, Matthew Lishak's amazing investigation into how inflation ruined our diet and health. And I'm also publishing Lynn Alden's Broken Money, her masterful exploration of the failures of the global financial system and how Bitcoin fixes it. This is a Bitcoiner's bookshop, so the books are printed in beautiful cloth hardcover made to last with an ice colored dust jacket on top. Go to thesafehouse.com and get yours now. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable health care. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash up front without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for CrowdHealth and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Safety in the Moose, always great to have you on again. And we're going to talk about your new book, Principles of Economics. How is everything going? Everything is good. Thank you for having me, Jimmy. It's always a pleasure to be talking to you, whether in person or through the uh, wonders of video technology. <laughs> yeah, and indeed, we do have uh, quite a few wonders. I wanted to uh, get into your book, Principles of Economics. For me, it was an eye-opening read. I've read a lot of Rothbard, Mises, and you know Hayek, and many others. Uh, but for me, this was the book uh, for an introduction to Austrian economics. Uh, touched on a lot of subjects that a lot of Austrian economics texts do not. Um, and I, I, I wanted to start with uh, with one of the premises that you put out, I believe, in your introduction, which is if you want to understand the conditions of the material world, it is most useful to study the actions of the humans who mold it. Um, and I, I wanted to get your take on how this approach of examining human action is very different than the traditional economics approaches that, you know, the lot of universities, a lot of macroeconomic uh, professors and people in the Fed and all the traditional econ economists uh, sort of, how is that different from that? Um, I think the main difference is that when you think of things through the human action lens, which is what the Austrians do, you realize that um, all of this matter that we see around us in the world is all of the product of what we do with our minds, with our hands, and how we perceive it. And so I guess a, a simple way of illustrating it is look at a place like Singapore. 
Singapore is just a barren rock somewhere in uh, the ocean, and it doesn't have anything that would obviously make it rich. Uh, 50, 60 years ago, it didn't have any of the, well, maybe a little more than 60 years ago. 100 years ago, you would not have expected that this place would be where it is right now. Nobody would have expected this would be one of the richest, most advanced, most technologically forward uh, societies on Earth. On the other hand, by the classical sort of uh, definition of wealth, you'd look at places like, say, uh, the Congo or uh, other parts of uh, Africa or the Amazon, and you'd say, wow, well, these things are so full of natural resources. Clearly, they're going to be rich. So if the world was just about the abundance of material things, then um, Congo would be one of the richest places in the world. Singapore would be one of the poorest places in the world. And the quality of life for the average Singaporean would be infinitely lower than that of uh, someone in Congo. And yet we find that the exact opposite happens. Why? Because it's not about material things. It's about human beings. It's about what human beings do. And so human beings are able to turn material things into wealth and into useful things for us, into goods and human beings are able to destroy those things as well. And uh, our ability to economize, our ability to act in an economically rational way that is productive, that is good for us, that is good for um, our well-being, is far more important than pretty much anything else in terms of um, uh, determining how things matter. So yeah, sure, the weather matters and natural geography matters and all those things matter, but ultimately what humans do is what matters the most. And if you want to think about economics through the lens of humans acting and how humans act, you will, I believe, find a much more powerful analytical framework for approaching the subject than if you were to look at it through the lens of um, what other schools of economics use, which, um, I mean, the, 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 there are many of them and there are many approaches, but some of them use, uh, most of them, I'd say today, use um, mathematical aggregates and they illustrate relationships between, the, the math, uh, between these mathematical aggregates in order to use them uh, to predict and understand how the economy goes. And so it's a very uh, physics envy based approach. It's let's try and make economics like physics because with physics, you look at a bunch of stuff and you calculate the um, force that is in, in, uh, impacted on it and then you can calculate how fast it can move and how far it can uh, travel and so on you can make these pretty precise calculations so why wouldn't we do something similar with um, uh, economics and that's the promise of mainstream economics for the last 100 years has been the attempt to try and do that and the way we do it is we look at these aggregate measures we construct them we study them we formulate theories about how these things need to be correlated with each other and how they influence each other and what the relationships are among them. And we uh, make rules and make laws about it, and then we're able to make predictions about how the future happens. So it is a very attractive idea because it would really be nice if you could run a human society with, well, I mean, it depends on who you are, but for a lot of people, it's very nice. The idea of being able to run a human society in the same way that you run a car, you engineer it to give you the output that you want, you press on the gas to get more of the acceleration that you want, you press on the uh, brakes to get the deceleration that you want. If you could do that with an economy, we could get rid of poverty, we could get rid of all kinds of nasty things. But just because you want something to be true doesn't mean it is and doesn't mean that it has to oblige you. And the reality does not owe you uh, that it conforms to your silly equations. And so Austrian economists would rather humbly uh, know what we can know with its limitations, whereas mainstream economists would rather ignore the limitations and pretend to know what they would like to know. I guess that's one way of putting it. Well, so the main thing and, uh, you know, reading the book, I, I, I think you get a lot of the uh, things that you're saying about uh, we need to be studying humans and their time preference and things like that to be able to better predict what, what's actually going to happen and, you know, their uh, their wants and desires and things like that. Uh, the The 
at, at the core of your criticism of the other schools of economics is this idea that you can simplify humans to homo economicus, which is essentially what they do is they assume that all humans are more or less the same, that they all sort of behave hyper rationally. Um, and instead, uh, and that that's the basis of all of these aggregates and, uh, you know, like outputs that they predict. They're, they're based on this simplifying assumption, which I, I think you're arguing uh, has no basis in being simplified. Like you can't simplify a human to be this hyper rational homo economicus. Yeah, and uh, it's it's hilarious for me that the majority of uh, times that you're um, that you're hearing people uh, making criticisms of Austrian economists, they immediately uh, start off with this, which is, oh well, these Austrians believe in Homo economicus, and they believe that markets are efficient and human beings are rational, and clearly we know that this is not accurate, and therefore Austrian <laughs> economists are silly and ridiculous, and it's hilarious <laughs> because it's uh, it's it's the biggest tell that you have no idea what Austrian economists uh, are, and also that your conception of Austrian economics comes from basically Marxist propaganda, which looks at um, which looks at anybody um, from Milton Friedman, uh, uh, anybody influenced remotely or in any way related to Milton Friedman, anybody who looks like a Milton Friedman from the vantage point of Karl Marx must be the same thing. And so this is true that uh, this is true for the neoclassical economists, for a lot of the modern economists and the Keynesians and the Chicago people, that they do use these assumptions. But it's not true about Austrians. Um, from the Austrian perspective, we cannot model human beings because human beings are far more complex than uh, we can imagine. Uh, ultimately, human beings have a will which drives them and they act based on their will, whereas uh, physical objects don't have a will. And so their reactions are predictable. You kick a ball, a certain amount of uh, strength, and you can know that uh, this amount of force exerted on the ball is going to push it this far at this speed to this location. You can make very precise predictions because it is um, an inert matter that reacts without any kind of internal direction. It's just particles and you move them around. And we have figured out how to predict the movements of these things. But you kick a human being and you're in for a can of worms of possible reactions. Who knows how and what way they might react to getting kicked. So it's a very different proposition. And it's ultimately down to the fact that human beings have this cognitive ability to understand the world, to reason about the world, and then to act upon it. And it's something that we cannot reduce into an equation in others because to do so it just assumes that you have human agency while everybody else is just an automaton everybody else is just a toy everybody else is just uh, uh an and 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 a predictable robot going around their day reacting to predictable things in predictable ways and everybody uh Nobody thinks of themselves as being that, but <laughs> it takes a certain amount of intelligence to understand that that's not true for anybody. That's any, any human being is not like that. And I think it's a trap that many people fall into it when you become a little bit um, educated. And some people should not be overeducated. I think we have a massive problem of people who <laughs> spend way too much time studying useless things that they don't need to study. But that gives them this idea that they are so much better, that they're so much different. And you see this at universities. You see so many people that arrive at this perspective that, well, look, I'm educated. I have this amazing master's degree or whatever from this amazing <laughs> university. And I got into so much debt to do this, to study with this professor who got so much research grants from the government to publish his research. So clearly I'm different and clearly I'm better and clearly I can plan your life because you're just an automaton reacting to stimuli in very predictable ways, whereas I am God's gift to humanity and I can figure out how to plan things. Um, so ultimately, mainstream economics is inextricably tied to uh, central planning as a mechanism mm -hmm. for thinking about how to approach the economic question because you're approaching economics from the 
perspective of how do we plan society to make it better? How do we make society more efficient, more powerful, uh, whatever it is that you want? Whereas Austrian economists are not approaching it from the perspective of central planners. And this is uh, this this is what economics used to be. It's 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 not an attempt by the government to plan society. It's just trying to study how human beings react to economic incentives and how they think about them, and uh, what that can tell us about economic decision making. Hmm. Yeah, I, uh, something that I picked out there from what you were saying is uh, you know Austrian eco- economists, I think. Um, value human dignity in some way, right? Like uh, recognize that each individual has different wants and needs and uh, and things like that. Whereas sort of the simplifying assumption of all uh, like central planners is, okay, let's let's assume that they're all the same and now let's, uh, let's figure out what we can do with it. Um, I, w- I want to get into sort of like the meat of the book and uh, and you introduce this uh, topic of scarcity and, uh, and and you say in the book an economic good being scarce will have greater demand than its supply and this creates rivalry around access to it. Um, can you explain why things are scarce and uh, and how um, that scarcity unleashes both uh, human creativity and building, but also like this desire to steal, uh, which um, unfortunately creates, uh, I, which destroys a lot of uh, uh, civilization. Yeah, um, I think the the way that I like to think of um, mm-hmm. scarcity is that it is a product of human time, the scarcity of human time. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, and I do this in chapter three of the book, so the first three chapters of the book are just the methodological um, launching pad for the rest of the book. So in the first chapter, I explain human action, which is the topic that we discussed in the first couple of questions. Then in the second chapter, I explain the concept of value and how it is discussed in an economic area and contribution of subjective value. And then the third chapter is one that is not really Austrian in that it is not mentioned in most Austrian textbooks in the way that I mention it, but I believe it is a very Austrian approach to the topic. And the third chapter is the topic of time. So uh, how we think about time as, um, as, a, as, a, as a topic in economics. And the, uh, I draw heavily on the work of Julian Simon for this. And I think Julian Simon, even though he's not an Austrian, I think he thought a lot like an Austrian. And in his work, he shows how the scarcity of physical things is basically um, relative scarcity. It's only scarcity to the extent that we can't have more of this thing because it would be too costly in terms of other things. So this is, I think, a very important point to understand about the physical world in which we live. The Earth is never running out of any of the resources that we have. We've been digging for those things for thousands of years. Gold, iron, copper. Thousands of years humans have been digging for for these things, and we keep finding more. Not only do we find more, it is cheaper today to produce those things than it has ever been, ever, in history. It just keeps getting cheaper. It just keeps becoming more and more abundant. Whatever it is, even the scarcest, rarest metals, we keep making more. Every year we find more gold. Every year we find more copper, titanium, everything. Every year there's more being produced and more is being put on the market and the price of those things continues to decline. Now that's not what it would look like if we were in a small little tiny planet and we were coming to the edge, we were coming to the end, we were about to finish and consume all of our resources. That's not what it would look like. It would look very different. We'd witness the price of these things going up more and more and more, and we'd be running into the scarcity of those things. You know, something would just be, uh, some things would just be getting very, very scarce and very, very expensive. But we don't see that. We see these things continuously get cheaper over time. And instead, the only thing that gets more expensive is human time. Human time continues to become more and more expensive because humans become more and more productive with their time. So what this tells us, and I get into this in more detail, I I even look at the size of Earth compared to the size of the mines that we have, and it's infinitely small. We we barely scratched the surface of the Earth. The Earth is so enormous. We've barely scratched the surface quite literally. And uh, the impact that we've had in terms of the abundance of minerals in Earth is practically inconsequential and significant. That's why our reserves of all these metals, all of these resources, 
continue to go up. The more we consume, the more reserves we have. That's because the more we consume, the more we mine, the more we prospect, the more we look for these resources, and the more we find. And so as people have been have spent the last century saying we're going to hit peak oil, we're going to hit peak oil, we're going to hit peak oil, they look at reserves today, and they look at consumption today, and they say, well, reserves can last us 50 years at current consumption levels. So in 50 years, the reserves are going to be done. And yet 50 years down the line, you find that our consumption has gone up significantly more. We've consumed maybe five-fold, five times more than what we consumed uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And yet the price of oil has gone down and the proven reserves of oil continue to go up. What has gone up also is human wages. So what this tells us is that the real scarcity is in the scarcity of human time. There's no limit on how much oil or gold or copper we can have, practically speaking, except how much time we dedicate to that. Because there's an infinite ocean of all of these things under the crust of the earth that we could just keep digging out. But we're never going to get anywhere near finishing 1% of that because it's way too expensive in terms of our time. If we wanted to keep digging into the gold to find all the gold or all the copper, we could starve ourselves as we stop producing anything else and keep focusing on only making more and more and more copper or gold or whatever it is, and we still wouldn't make a dent in the gigantic stores of this that exist on Earth. So the reason we don't have more gold is not because the earth doesn't have enough gold for us or doesn't have enough copper or oil. The reason we don't is because we don't have enough time to be out there getting more of these resources. So that, for me, redefines the question of scarcity as not scarcity of material goods because these things are plentiful everywhere. It's the scarcity of our time. Our inability to produce more things is inextricably the result of our inability to have infinite time. We have a limited amount of time on Earth. We can only make so many things. And we'd rather spend that time enjoying our life, doing the things that we enjoy, doing the things that we like. And so that's where the scarcity comes from. That's why we are in this situation where everything has to be scarce, because ultimately it all comes from the economizing of our time, the scarcity of our time. Where do we spend our time? On? Uh, do we spend it enjoying ourselves? Do we spend it producing? And so once I introduce that, that helps me to uh, situate the discussion of the rest of the book, the last 15 chapters of the book, uh, as it's all 18 chapters. So once in that, we do that in chapter three. And then I propose to think of all of economics as being the question of economizing time. Everything that we do is our way of economizing time. How do we make our time um, b longer on Earth? How do we gain more time? And so to do that, you do the things that are required for survival. How do you avoid dying? How do you increase your chances of surviving? And you do this by trying to improve the quality of your time, the subjective value that you place on your time. So you try and increase the amount of enjoyment that you get. And the way to do that is to seek out the good things in life that people want. And that, I think, is, the good, uh, is, is a good way of thinking of material economics and on the economics of material objects. Think of it all as the process of optimizing our time trying to increase the quantity and the quality of time that we have on Earth. And so what are the things that we do? We economize. What does that entail? Well, these are the topics of chapters uh, 4 to 12, basically. And so chapter 4 is labor. We work. That's the one basic thing that all creatures do. Animals hunt and graze in order to get their resources and sustenance so that they can improve the quantity and quality of time that they have on Earth. Humans do the same thing. We work. But we're much more sophisticated than animals, so we go beyond just working. We develop the concept of property. Once, we are once we've been able to understand the development of the concept of property, we've increased our well-being enormously because you don't have to go and look for a, for a shelter every day. You just secure a part of the world that you call yours, and then th that's your shelter. And then every day you have shelter, and then you can spend your time that you used to spend looking for shelter every day. You can spend it on doing other things. So property is 
an enormously important invention. Somebody, I can't remember who it was, but somebody a few days ago mentioned it to me that uh, you could make the argument that property is the greatest invention that humanity has ever made, the concept of property. I think there's a case to be made for that um, because all of our modern economy, all of our ability to have a civilized society, the entire premise of human beings is being able to live together as a society is entirely predicated on the respect of property. So labor, property, and then the third big one, capital. And that's a form of property that is not consumed for its own sake, but that is used to produce other things. I believe this one is also enormously important, and I discuss capital in detail. Number uh, four is energy or power. How do we direct energy and power towards meeting our uh, needs? And then number uh, five would be uh, trade, how we trade with one another. No, wait, yeah. Is that the sequence? Embarrassed to have forgotten the sequence of my chapters, but I guess it is, okay, yeah. it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. And so then you move on it, to it trade. It is trade and then, uh, and then money, yeah. Yeah. So, th so the first four that I mentioned were the ones that are in the context of an individual on their own. These are the things that you can do if you are just one single person on an island. You will seek to maximize the energy that you can consume by collecting firewood or trying to use the water from a stream to do the things that you need to do for your life. All of these things that you could do, uh, all of these are things that you could do on your own. But then we move to the concept of what a society does and how we economize as a society. So the first thing we do is we trade with one another. Mm. And that's an enormous, enormous advantage. And once we are able to live together in a system where we respect each other's property and we are able to exchange things with one another peacefully and co consensually without initiating violence against each other, we open up an entire world of possibilities that massively increases our productivity and our ability to um, meet our needs and, again, improve the quality and quantity of time that we have on Earth. And then trade, the next step is um, money. When we start utilizing money, we live in an economy that's based around money. That massively improves our productivity and the value and the quantity of time that we have on Earth, because when we use money, we can specialize, and we can specialize within a very large division of labor that allows for extremely sophisticated um, division of tasks with increasingly, um, uh, with high, very high productivity that continues to increase over time. And that's only possible with a system in which we have a neutral form of money, and that gives us a market economy. And that is capitalism. So chapters 11 and 12 discuss capitalism and a market economy, what is meant by the term capitalism from the Austrian perspective, why it is so important, and what needs to happen for there to be a capitalist society. Well, uh, so you, you cover quite a bit there. Uh, but the, <laughs> the, uh, the thing that I, I, I want to get to is sort of like that, that capital accumulation, uh, 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 that creativity that humans express in sort of in a way to relieve that scarcity for other people right the, so um you know coming up with new processes and ways to produce stuff that ultimately fills their needs um in a way that reduces that scarcity that that's uh, I think what you argue in the book is that that's to not be fulfilled necessarily by the current production processes that exist. Uh, that that uh, for uh, that uh, unleashes sort of like that uh, human ingenuity to uh, you know e essentially benefit uh, the rest of humanity, and that's maybe what you would call um, civilization building. Whereas you know the other fact, uh, the other way to deal with scarcity is just to go around and steal from other people. And um, you know, a as you point out, uh, having proper the concept of property means that. It's yours, and that other people can't take it away. But that that's uh, that's another way to sort of like deal with scarcity. So, for me, the, those two are the sort of main ways to deal with this economic fact. Um, I I I w want you to uh, explain why it's so much more important to go with the obviously creative way rather than being sort of like the jerk that sort of goes around and steals from people and so on. 
Yeah, so I realize I, I uh, veered off. Mm -hmm. well, but your question was an enormous one. It's basically mm -hmm. asking me to summarize the entire book. So <laughs> um, I guess you could say that there is a little bit of a narrative and an agenda uh, underlying the book in a sense that it's not just here, let me tell you what capital is and let me tell you what uh, money is and how trade works and how there's comparative advantage. There's definitely an agenda there. It's a Sefer Dina Mons book. It's, <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not going to be innocent of me trying to uh, badger uh, my ideas into your brain. And the, under, um, the, the underlying theme here is the concept of human civilization and why human beings um, should value civilization, why human beings value civilization. Uh, it's not a matter of should. We do value it. We all choose to be part of the division of labor. Um, even the most angry, bitter uh, people about it who are always complaining about it, they don't, uh, they don't choose to go and live away from civilization. They still complain while using the products of civilization to voice their complaints, to make their complaints more and more efficient, and because obviously uh, everything is much better when done through civilization. So... Um, what I present is in, in, um, in all of these chapters leading up to chapter 12 are all of the ways in which we economize and the way in which we economize, um, all, of these are, um, all of these are voluntary ways of economizing. So and nowhere here have I mentioned anything that involves ultimate property. And so if you simply take that as a starting point, if you take that as your algorithm for how you deal with the world, you respect people's property. People can respect their property. We can all deal with one another. We can all live together. And we trade, and we develop a monetary system, and we develop a capitalist economy, and we accumulate capital, and we increase our productivity, and we benefit enormously from one another. This is one way to do it. But then, um, in chapters 16, 17, and 18, the last three chapters of the book, I analyze the economics of the other way of doing it, which is... Mm. If at every single point here, and you could have chosen the other path, you could have chosen, no, I don't want to res respect this other person's property. I'm going to go fight him and take it from him and make it mine. You could have said, I'm not going to trade with this guy. I'm just going to steal his stuff. I'm not going to uh, let people just have a monetary system built around gold that works. I'm going to screw them over with fiat. Mm. These are all possibilities that can happen all along. Um, and all of these are essentially forms of aggression. At every, that's the other side of the coin. So either you deal with people consensually, in which every person does what they want, and only engages in transactions in which they uh, which they want to take part in or the alternative is aggression one person aggresses against the other and the person who aggresses um either takes things from the other or um kills the victim or gets to use the victim as slave labor all of these are possibilities and it's an entirely um, common occurrence in our world, unfortunately. But that doesn't mean that, you know, economists have nothing to say about it. In fact, it's just another form of human action that we can study. And it's the action where somebody tries to impose their will on another. In a nutshell, I think the case for civilization, the case for the first path, is the way that I argue it in the book is... I just simply illustrate that this is what everybody shows, everybody does anyway. 99.999% of everybody's life is spent, engaged in civilization, in the peaceful division of labor, in respecting property rights. And even the most violent criminals, even the people who re reject these ideas the most fervently, the most uh, violent statist who wants the government to own everything, and control everyone even these people they still act based on the fact that they are part of a civilization they still use civilization for the majority of their actions and i think this is for me this is really the best argument that i could go with because i can make the moral argument for it which i believe is uh, impeccable uh, you know there's no arguing against it that you don't have a right to go around aggressing against other people who, and if you do it 
um, it's it's clearly immoral. And then there's the consequentialist right, which is the consequentialist argument, which is if you aggress against others, they're going to aggress against you, and then you're going to find yourself in conflict rather, and you're wasting your life away in destruction rather than production, and that's not going to pay off. Um, and I obviously use that one as evidence, but I think the main point that um, is that civilization doesn't need me to defend it, um, mm. because anybody who's attacking civilization, anybody who's attacking the concept of private property, is um, essentially a hypocrite and is an incoherent hypocrite that is just making idiotic noises in order to um, sound edgy, but. <laughs> in reality, if you can communicate with me, if I can get to hear your ideas in any way or another, in any way whatsoever today, in today's world, I, I'm likely hearing it through books that you've printed or through podcasts that you've made or blog posts. And simply producing those things requires such an enormous amount of um, products coming out of the capitalist division of labor, that it makes whatever noises you produce against that division of labor completely immaterial. It's, 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 it's completely nonsensical. It's, you are completely engulfed in the process of capitalism, property rights, and that's the only reason you're able to secure a laptop. Even if you stole your laptop in order to communicate those ideas, that laptop could not have been produced without a very large network of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who work within a system of property rights. The people who mined the metals that went into your laptop, the people who designed the laptop, the people who made the advertisements for the laptop, the people who put the pieces of the laptop together. They all had property rights. They all worked in a system of coherent property rights where they all respected each other's property rights in order for this miracle laptop to finally make it to your desk for you to sit and write these crazy diatribes about how the division of labor is actually evil. <laughs> so in reality, we see that the, the um, you know, they say hypocrisy is the compliment that vice pays to virtue and mm. critics of capitalism are paying it the supreme um, compliment of not being able to communicate their stupid noises in any form other than through the products of capitalism. And so that, for me, is what's really um, the, the, the knockout blow. That, and we have some example of someone, I think he lives in Oregon, who decided to go off the grid. And he didn't want to be part of civilization. He spent, I think it's been decades... Uh, where he was just out in the wild and uh, he didn't want to be part of society. And, I, you know, a lot of people have this idea that we are in a broken society, I don't want to be part of society, society is so evil, I just want to go out there and live independently. And the vast majority of them don't do it. This guy did it. Well, how did it work out for him? Well, it worked out for him uh, that he's now in jail. Why? Because even though he didn't want to be part of society, he still wanted to steal from society. And so he would always walk to places where people where, um, where people had homes and had property, and he'd steal food from there. And that's how he managed to survive. Because, <clears throat> contrary to anti-civilizationist propaganda, just going out on your own in the jungle is not <laughs> fun. It's not easy. You can't hunt easily. It, there, there isn't an open buffet of delicious food for you available every day. You have to hunt every day, and you have to economize. And it's just, you're still going to be part of an economic process. You're still economizing. You're just choosing to play it in extremely, extremely, extremely hard mode. You're choosing to economize on your own while uh, all alleviating yourself of the um, privilege of using the thousands of years of accumulating capital and knowledge that humanity has developed. And you're trying to do it on your own. And of course, it's not going to work. It's going to end up catastrophically. And that's why all of these off-the-grid experiments end up failing 
Or if they succeed, I mean, they succeed by being off the grid while being extremely reliant on a very um, sophisticated and expensive division of labor that got us to the point where we are able to be off the grid. In other words, really rich people can afford to go live a primitive life after they've bought a giant farm and decked it out with all of the modern equipment that they need in order to keep them uh, sustainable for a few years. And then they can say, well, we're uh, unplugged from society. But it's really only because you've managed to buy all of these pumps and heating devices and all kinds of really sophisticated things. Try and do it on your own with your bare hands. No money, no machinery, no equipment. Go out there and see how far you get. It's not going to be very far. So that's kind of the overall um, argument. Uh, but I guess, uh, and then, then of course, I, do, I, I, I get into it in a lot more detail. And I think uh, just the key, uh, one way that I ex explain this is think about the concept of trade. When I introduce the topic of trade, yeah, this is, in most econ textbooks use this example of Robinson Crusoe on an island and Robinson Crusoe trying to um, economize. And then he runs into this other guy on the island, this guy called Friday. And here it's a very interesting choice. Both of these men have a bunch of stuff. Before they met each other, they managed to make a home. They managed to build a few weapons, and they were able to hunt. And here, you have the question of, well, maybe I should just kill him and take his stuff. Both of them had that idea. But think about it. You kill this guy, and then you take his spear, and you take his stuff, and you take his home, and then what? Well, then you're back to being alone. And now you need to hunt on your own, and you're still facing life all, all on your own. Whereas if you keep him alive, and, you, and he keeps you alive, and you both agree to keep each other alive, well, you both get a much better deal, because now you both have an economy of two, which is a lot more productive than economy of one. You can specialize in one thing, and he can specialize in another thing. And then for the rest of your lives, you both have a higher productivity because of your specialization. So that is a far bigger bounty than anything you can get if you just killed him. You kill him today, you take his stuff, and that's it. And then you're stuck with your own productivity for the rest of your life. But if you don't kill him, and if you both survive, and you both live together, and you, well, not necessarily live together, but if you both live and trade with one another and uh, cooperate, well, you have a lifetime of increased productivity to look forward to, and your life is going to be better because now you can specialize and he can specialize. And then with more and more people that come into your economy, more productivity, uh, your productivity goes up, his productivity goes up, everybody's productivity goes up. And that's the choice that we all make. We all use things that are the product of an 8 billion people economy. 8 billion people worldwide are cooperating in order to make those things that we, you and I use, the laptops and the smartphones. And that's how we can have those things. It's not possible. If you wanted to live in an economy of 100 people, you won't be able to have laptops. If you wanted to live in an economy of a million people, I think you won't even be able to make laptops. Not even a million people would probably be able to produce a laptop. Just think about how much work needs to be done and how expensive all of these things would be done if they were done at a very tiny scale, if you wanted to produce microchips, but only for a million people, think about how expensive that would be. If you wanted to produce mine copper and make silicon and do all of those things, but only for a million people, it'll be very expensive. And likely, it'd be too expensive for people to get to do those things because we'd be stuck doing far more primitive things. In an economy of only a million people, we'd have a very hard time securing enough food to survive. So that's why we all end up being part of civilized society for the vast majority of our time. And I think um, in, in, in the last few chapters, I discussed this as just, it's just another form of economic uh, decision making where we um, deal with the concept of violence and we deal with the concept of coercion like it is any other economic decision in that not being subject to economic coercion is, uh, or not being subject to any kind of coercion is a good. And it's an economic good. And so in order to get that good, um, we act and human beings work to get that. And the reality of the matter is that security and freedom from coercion is a good, and it is a good that is on the market. And if you uh, ignore government propaganda and just look at the reality, 
you see that the vast majority of the market for security is private. Even though most people tend to think that security is something that the government provides for us, in reality, the vast majority of the market for security is private. There are more private security guards in the world than there are police officers. The majority of the world's uh, arms manufacturers are private companies. They are able to make these guns and weapons because they are part of the division of labor. They buy their raw materials on the market. They hire engineers from the market and they buy their factories and everything that they need on the market and they produce goods that they sell on the market. Yes, a lot of that goes to the governments, but we still have a vast majority of weapons manufactured are being manufactured by the private sector. And so the more you think about it, the more you see it's just another market. And in fact, the state is just an entity on this market, which acts to its own interest. And the way that it does it is that it brainwashes people into convincing themselves that the government is acting for your own good when it isn't. Well, um, Assuming that you actually are going to participate in civilization, I, I want to get into um, this concept of value, and, and you did touch upon it, uh, but I, I want to read you a couple of quotes from your book. Value cannot be a constant property of objects. It is a conscious phenomenon in our minds, and human values cannot be measured in one standardized unit. Um, so the, uh, as you pointed out before, a lot of these other uh, schools of economics have something like physics envy and want to quantify everything. And, uh, and that's something that you assert in the book. You cannot do because it is, uh, it, it's, it's something that's inside somebody's mind and that's not really quantifiable. Um, there, there is no fixed value, in other words. Uh, but, uh, but for a lot of us, um, I think there is sort of like this, um, how we think about value is often contradictory to that. The, the economic reality is that there is no fixed value, that it's based on individual preferences and so on. Uh, but what a lot of people do instead of figuring out um, the utility that you can get out of getting a said good or something like that is they just look at the market price, right? Like just sort of look at how other people value it and decide whether or not that that that's... Um, they, they don't make this sort of like rational economic decision. Instead, they, um, they do something that's a little more like, okay, well, that, that's just sort of the price for this. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm going to pay. Um, how, like from, from, a Austrian economics perspective, from uh, like sort of knowing what you know about how, uh, how things are and um, how uh, division of labor works and so on. How should we be thinking about value um, for the purposes of living out our lives? Because in a way, I think this is how you end up, uh, a lot of people end up with crap that they don't need and s sort of just consuming for the sake of consumption and so on, instead of actually thinking about their needs and um, getting the value that you want and so on. So I'm not sure that I would, um, that I would doubt people's um, valuations because value is subjective. And so mm. if you decide that you value another piece of plastic crap in your house um, more than you value uh, the $500 in your bank account, who am I to disagree? That's your subjective valuation. And so um, I don't think the issue here is that you don't understand valuation. It's just mm. you did valuation. It's just I disagree with it. I think uh, I'd rather keep the 500 bucks than have that uh, plastic thing. You would rather have the plastic thing. But that's just all trade happens because of the fact that we have differing valuations. The way that I think of it uh, when it comes to this uh, is that it is the destruction of money, which is a very important topic in economics. And I discuss it in Principles of Economics, but of course I discuss it in a lot more depth in the fiat standard and the Bitcoin standard, particularly the fiat standard. Um, and I think um, it's, it's, it's not an issue that is with the way that people think about valuation in as much as it is an issue of... Um, people not having access to good monetary technology. Mm. And so if we think about money, 
as a technology. Over time, it has evolved in a way that makes it better. Like all technologies, things just keep getting better. We keep making them better. And the way money works better is that it holds on to its value better. And so mm. all throughout history, we see that money is constantly being replaced by something harder. We're always going from money to harder money. And that's better money because it allows you to store value for the future more efficiently. And that then allows you to think about the future more efficiently and to prioritize and value the future more. And then the more you do that, the more you will, um, the more you will think of the future and the less you will have a very high time preference or a very um, present oriented outlook, which is really the root of most of people's problems. Um, when you just think about the present rather than thinking about the future, that's how you get into trouble in life. So um, I think with most um, w with w with this kind of economic problem, I I believe what has happened in the last century is that since we've moved away from hard money to an easier money, we've reversed the process of civilization. We've reversed the process of economic advancement that has been marching for millennia and this might be the biggest single detour that we've taken away from the march for civilization obviously all throughout we're always getting setbacks and we're always having uh, bad years or bad decades when bad things happen when um, natural disasters strike when wars strike when uh, despotic leaders destroy their societies all of these things have set us back but what we're going through now it's been more than a century now that we've been moving toward an, an easier money which has been increasingly devaluing uh, our futures increasingly inc allowing us or forcing us to discount our future more and more and therefore prioritize the present and so with this world where you don't have a reliable easy mechanism for saving wealth into the future you are much more insecure about the future so you discount the future heavily and so therefore you prioritize the present and so that's why people get rid of their money very quickly and buy stupid crap that they don't need well maybe it's not an entirely irrational decision because maybe they need that crap more than they need uh, more fiat in their bank account because the alternative is fiat is sitting in your bank account and is being devalued so you can buy this stupid plastic crap now or keep the money in your bank account and then buy 20% uh, less stupid plastic crap in two years time why would you want to do that you might as well just spend the money right now whereas if you would expect the money to appreciate if you had a good perspective uh, a good reason uh, to expect the money is going to appreciate over time then you would likely um, you would be more likely to not spend money on needless crap that you need because you knew that if you kept the $500 then in two years time they'll buy you 20 percent more or 10 percent more of whatever it is that you want so i think really fiat is the um, is the driver here and i don't think um, it's something that we can fix by just um, preaching at people i think uh, it's, it's it's not exact you need a technical solution for the problem of broken money you need a form of money that um, does not lose its value over time if only we had such a thing. <laughs> if only, if only. All right, uh, a couple of other things that I thought were super interesting, I'd, I'd love for you to explain it. Um, the concept of unemployment did not exist as an economic term before the 20th century, and you, you say this uh, in the chapter on labor. Uh, can you explain uh, the history of unemployment and what actually causes it rather than sort of the current um, paradigm which is that it just sort of happens during economic downturns and there's nothing you can do about it other than print lots more money yeah um basically if you look at the concept of unemployment it really only became a major issue in the 20th century with fiat and it's just been normalized that um but this is just what happens unemployment is just a natural normal part of a market economy in fact, uh, I've just looked it up right now. I should have done this for the book. 
This is this is an amazing chart. Can I share a screen uh, here? Uh, let me see if I can give you the. I don't know how to get you. If you uh, click, yeah, yeah uh, I can. Send me a link. I can, I, can, I can share it. I can share it. I can share it. Okay, great. Look at this Google Ngram viewer, and that uh -huh. gives you the amount of. Um, oh wow. Okay, one sec, one sec. Sorry, one sec. Let me just stop this. Mm -hmm. Could you see the entire window? You could see the frames up at the top. I just, I just saw the um, Google Trends and on or the Google chart of unemployment. That's all I saw. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, but that that was super interesting. It was zero, and then it just it just starts going up. Yeah. Sorry, one sec. So as a matter of fact, I just got this idea to look this up right now, and it's a mm -hmm. very, very fascinating chart mm -hmm. because it conforms with what I say in the book, which is that before mm -hmm. the 20th century, there was no such thing as unemployment as a topic. Mm -hmm. People didn't really mention it. So Ngram, Google Books Ngram, is a, um, is, is, a, is a tool that looks at the uh, frequency of the occurrence of a certain word in... Uh, books that have been digitized by Google, which is an increasingly large percentage of all the books that have been ever published. So particularly for the English language, they've got a very, very large number of books that have been published since 1800 that have all been digitized and put into um, into the Google database, and now they've, they just count the words. So look at this. In the 1800s, Practically very, very, very little mention of all unemployment. And then 20th century happens, and look at that. Suddenly, unemployment is a serious issue, culminating in 1932. That's when it peaks. That's when we get peak concern of unemployment. And then, of course, we get another one in the 1970s with mm. the inflation of the 1970s. And then since then, it's become less and less of an issue, but it's still infinitely more of an issue than it was in the 19th century because in the 19th century it just did not exist as a concept i should have definitely shared that i should have used this chart <laughs> in the book maybe um, maybe a second edition or something like that uh, I, yeah, I do find it interesting because this this is all a percentage of the words and not like absolute numbers or anything like that so it's not because you know there were less books published in 1800 or something like that it's just of all the words that are used in all the books, uh, unemployment just comes up way more often uh, on a per per book base or per I guess word basis or something like that. So, yeah, pretty crazy. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. in the book, I try and explain why this is the case without even looking at this chart. Uh, but mm -hmm. the reason is that before the 19th century, the, that there was just no such thing as unemployment as we currently understand it. If you wanted to work, you looked for a job and you took the job that offered you the highest salary that you could get. If you didn't like the salary that somebody was offering you, then you just didn't work. And you didn't call that unemployment. You had a life. You, you were busy being a father. You were busy being a son. You were busy being a wife. You were busy being a mother. You were busy doing things with your life. Um, you were busy learning a skill. You were busy practicing a hobby. And that was it. But the reason the, why this became an issue in the 20th century is because of two main phenomena. Number one, of course, fiat, which ruins everything, as mm -hmm. uh, your book <laughs> helpfully informs us. Bitcoin does, in fact, ruin everything, yes. And uh, it's the reason it ruins this is that um, the reason Bitcoin creates, uh, sorry, fiat creates unemployment is that once you get inflation, the first thing that happens is you get the business cycle. So there's an artificial boom with malinvestments taking place because people can get cheaper credit than they otherwise would in a free market. So banks are able to grant more credit than savers are allocating resources for investment. And so that means that investors undertake more investments than they have resources for. And so parts of that investment are inevitably going to have to stop and die at a certain point when the shortage of resources gets exposed. And so that's what creates the business cycle. So there will usually be 
um, a concentration of economic activity in a specific sector of the economy. And the reason that concentration is happening in there because there maybe there's some credit uh, incentives for people to lend and borrow in that sector or maybe there's just a big bubble in the stock market in that sector so there will be a concentration uh, of the bubble in a specific sector which causes an unsustainable boom and then causes a crash and then when that crash happens you've got a devastation of a very large number of businesses in the same sector and so those businesses go out of business or they hire or fire a lot of their workers and the result in both cases is that you have a large number of people who just got laid off at the same time with the same set of skills and the same set of skills that just became um, massively uneconomical to have because they're very abundant. So too many people trained for a particular job because they thought this was the future, because this was where the boom was. Turns out the boom was just a credit-driven mania. And then when the credit mania died down, you have way too many people that are uh, qualified in these things that don't need anywhere near as many people. And so that's one thing. That's the one way you get unemployment and uh, because of fiat with business cycle. The second one, of course, is inflation, just rising prices. When prices rise, that causes uh, workers to demand higher wages. And that is not always possible. So when you're an employer and um, money gets in, the money supply is inflated, the value of uh, your goods declines the value of uh, your money declines. Sorry, the value of your good uh, stays the same. The, the price of your goods goes up, but the value of your money declines. Well, you're in trouble now. As a worker, you're in trouble because your savings have declined and your wages in real terms have declined, even though they stay the same in nominal terms. And so you're less well off. And so you need to work more and you need to earn more. But the business is also worse off because their money has also gotten devalued. So it's not like they were benefiting from the inflation. The inflation benefits the government and the people connected to the government, the parasite sector of the economy, but it hurts the worker and it hurts the business. And so the result is that the business goes out of business or the business fires the worker. But in both cases, it's not good news for the worker. So you get some unemployment from the inflation. The inflation itself creates unemployment. So the business cycle and the inflation create this unemployment which shouldn't have existed, wouldn't have existed otherwise because the worker and the employer were both happy to work on these terms. And then when you destroyed the currency, which is what their contract is denominated in, you've destroyed their relationship. You've destroyed their ability to work together peacefully and cooperatively. And so you destroyed the jobs for a lot of people. Then the second thing is the minimum wage. And the minimum wage comes along as a way of trying to fix the, product, the, the problems of inflation. So because of inflation, they're raising wages, uh, sorry, they're raising prices. Uh, sellers are having to raise prices because inflation is happening. Everybody thinks the sellers are being evil, producers are evil, capitalists are evil. And the way we fix that is that we do what? Raise the minimum wage, raise the minimum wage, and then the workers will be able to work and they'll be able to earn more and then they'll be able to afford the things that they could afford before the inflation. So then we get a minimum wage raise and that just leads to more unemployment because now employers are faced with a choice of you, you you're, they're told basically it's illegal for you to hire anybody who is, uh, whose productivity is lower than the productivity of the minimum wage. And so that creates a very large number of people who want to work who could go and get a job but can't get it because their productivity is lower than the productivity of the minimum wage. And therefore, this is where the real nefarious part of the unemployment story happens. These people are not just unemployed. These people become unemployable because the way that you become employable, the way that you increase your productivity, the way that you learn any kind of useful skills to produce for your work is that you go out there and you do the work. You'll learn how it's done, and that gives you the productivity. So the first job that you get, whatever career you choice you choose, your first job, you're practically paying to be there. You're not getting paid. So think about the first year of residency for a medical doctor. Think about the amount of time that they put into their job and their um, the time that they put into their studying. And 
I remember when my brother was doing it, uh, we ran the numbers on it, and per hour he was earning less than the janitors in the hospital. <laughs> and yet, all of these doctors, highly successful people who go to the best medical schools, they fight tooth and nail to get these residencies. Why do they do it? Why do they want to go and get employed at a salary after 12 years of school, eight years of college? Why do they want to go and earn less than the janitor, which they could have done after finishing 10th grade? Because the value of that job is not in the money that you make from the job. It's in the uh, experience that you get. Once you've gotten a year or two under your belt as a doctor in a hospital, then you're valuable. Now, then you've seen how the system works, and then you become extremely productive. Then you can be put into a real job as an actual doctor, and then you're going get to get paid the big bucks. So well, that's true for engineers who start off with internships. That's true with lawyers. It's true with any job, even the highest paid jobs in the world. At the first rung of the ladder, first rung of the ladder, you are not going to be paid well. You are going to need to go and basically get hazed by your boss in order to develop the character that is required for you to learn that job. So the minimum wage prevents this from happening. The minimum wage prevents you from getting on the first rung of the ladder, and then it makes all the other rungs of the ladder unattainable for you because you can't get there. So that creates this concept of people who are unemployed. They're not unemployed because they want to be. They're unemployed because their money is broken. So it's fiat and minimum wage. But another factor, I think, which makes this more of an issue in the 20th century is also related to fiat, is the fact that in a, in, in a gold standard world, people had savings. People would work and then they'd keep the savings. And then it was normal for people to take time off from work and just not work for a year or two or three or whatever it is. If you work hard and you make a bit of money, it's entirely normal and feasible for you to take time off of work and just not do a job. So you're getting paid this salary right now, but you've worked really well over the last five years. You've made so much money. It's probably not worth it for me to go and get this job this year. And you can do that because your money holds on to its value. Now in a world in which the money doesn't hold on to its value, what do you do? Well, you can't. You have to be out there. You have to be working. You're constantly needing to be a wage slave because all of your savings are constantly dissipating. Your savings are constantly losing value. So it is a big deal if you're not working. You have to be working because you need to be on the hamster wheel because you can't get off the hamster wheel because off the hamster wheel is just the fiat abyss. Your money loses value and you are drifting into destitution slowly. So everybody needs to be working. So you combine those factors, and that's why in the 20th century we get fiat and we get unemployment. Uh, well, speaking of uh, lack of savings, um, you, you say in another part of the book, and this is the chapter on capital, I believe, saving is the mother of capital. And, uh, and later on, you also say owning capital is a responsibility and a liability. Can you explain both uh, what both of those things mean and how, how that applies to us today and how, 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 we, should, um, how we should think about capital uh, so that we cre uh, you know, make a better uh, widget or goods and services and so on? Yeah, I think the first thing to keep in mind is that um, one of the most important concepts that I try and communicate in the book is the idea that uh, is to debunk and, and, and fight the idea that capital is some sort of heavenly privilege given to a specific <laughs> class of people. And, um, and you know, this is the uh, Marxist idea that uh, some people just have capital and therefore they're blessed and rich and destined <laughs> to continue to exploit the people who don't have capital, as if capital is just a blessing that is granted. But that's not true. There's a very, very high cost to capital. And all of the people that are railing against capital, if they would shut up for 15 minutes and try and understand what capital is, I promise you they'd be a lot happier with their lives because they'd be able to secure some capital and figure it out rather than just continue to uh, shake their fist at it. <laughs> so uh, the 
the cost of capital, the real reason why capital is so important, so difficult to have, and why it's not easy to have it, is that in order to have capital, you have to forego consumption. This is the most important concept which Keynesian economics has managed to drum out of people's brains with a lot of propaganda. People don't think you need to sacrifice consumption in order to have capital because they think capital could just be provided by the central bank because the central bank prints money and now we can all borrow and then we can all invest. But they don't understand that that money cannot create capital goods. All capital goods are goods that can be consumed in one way or the other. So every taxi cab out there is someone's capital that could be used as a private car for just joy rides. And instead, you give up the joy ride so that you could put it into work with a cab driver who's out there driving it. Every single piece of capital is only possible because somebody for, uh, forewent consumption. Somebody decided, I'm not going to consume this amount of money, I'm not going to buy a stupid toy that I don't need, I'm not going to go on a stupid vacation that I don't need, I'm not going to spend money on things that I don't need, I'm going to invest this in a productive asset that is going to hopefully make more returns for me than the money that I'm going to put in. So first of all, there's this need to forego consumption. And it's not just a th hypothetical need. Every single capital good that you see anywhere in the world, every single office building, every single tractor, every single factory, all of it has owners who could today decide, you know what, I'm done with this thing, I'm going to sell this thing. And they could sell it and they could take that money and throw a giant party with it. You could buy a yacht with it. You could never have to work for another day in your life with it. And yet, all those people continue to not consume those things and so to put them up as a capital good. So it's not, um, and, and, and as a capital good, it's not just that you decide, all right, I'm going to make this into capital and then it's going to give me money. No. As I say, it was more of a liability than an asset in a sense because you can't just say, all right, well, I have this million dollars. I'm going to turn it into capital instead of making, you know, I'm not going to buy a boat with it. I'm not going to throw a party with it. I'm going to make it into capital. I'm going to use the capital in order to become more and more. Um, and I'm going to try and use the returns from the capital to have a higher income in the future. Well, you can't just decide that in the abstract you have to decide how and where you deploy your capital and how and where you deploy your capital is an extremely difficult and uh, complicated question which is uh, which entails a lot of risk because you could lose your money by uh, allocating it into the wrong places so there's an enormous risk involved with capital not only do you need to forego consumption, you're foregoing consumption for something completely uncertain. You might not even get to have a better return. You may have been better off buying that boat. And then, of course, there's the risk of, uh, the, there's the depreciation, which capital wears down. Uh, all machines lose their efficiency over time. The entropy kicks in and things fall apart. So you're, co you're constantly losing the value that you stored into your capital goods. So all of these things, I think if people understood them, they'd have a lot more sympathy towards the plight of the capitalist, who is the, 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 the fuel that keeps our modern world going, is the fact that people save and don't just consume everything. That's why we have capital. That's why we have productivity increases. That's why we have industrialization. That's why we have all of the nice things that we have. And it's high time that people started valuing capitalism more and capital more. The syllabus for my new online economics course, Principles of Economics, is now available on safedean.com. The course will take place over 18 lectures, each based on one chapter from my new book, Principles of Economics, which will be available for free as an ebook for everyone registering for the course. Lectures will be released once every two weeks on Mondays, starting on the 25th of September 2023, and will be available in video and audio format. Live discussion seminars will be held once a week on Thursdays at alternating time slots 12 hours apart to ensure learners can attend from all over the world. I'm happy to announce that I have set up my new publishing house and online bookstore, The Safe House, which will be publishing and delivering the best Bitcoin and Austrian economics books worldwide in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook formats. 
Go to thesafehouse.com to buy my latest book, Principles of Economics, as well as the Fiat Standard and the Bitcoin Standard. And now I'm also publishing Fiat Food, Matthew Lishak's amazing investigation into how inflation ruined our diet and health. And I'm also publishing Lynn Alden's Broken Money, her masterful exploration of the failures of the global financial system and how Bitcoin fixes it. This is a Bitcoiner's bookshop, so the books are printed in beautiful cloth hardcover made to last with an ice colored dust jacket on top. Go to thesafehouse.com and get yours now. The, the chapter that I thought was probably the most interesting in your book, and this uh, uh, was was the one on energy. And, uh, and you assert in that chapter that we really shouldn't be thinking of energy um, as like jewels or something like that, but as power, because the delivery of energy over time is the important thing. Can you explain what that means and why uh, why energy is so important in sort of uh, examining uh, the uh, economics uh, or in the field of economics, rather? Yeah, so I think one uh, one this is this this is one of the things that. Sorry, my daughter's very loud. <laughs> Can you hear her? Yeah, I just heard one cry. That's all. It's all, it's all good. Okay. So I think uh, one thing that my book does, which is um, uh, not something that you would get in a usual Austrian econ textbook or uh, mainstream econ textbook, is that I give center stage to the topic of energy and the economics of energy. And the reason I do this is twofold. On the one hand, I believe that thinking uh, about economics in the proper Austrian marginal way, which is what I introduced in chapter two of the book, Marginal Analysis, uh, is extremely useful toward understanding how energy markets work. It's a very, very powerful mental tool. And it's not an analysis that I've seen anybody um, do anywhere. So I, I believe that that was very important just because it, it, it deserved to be given center stage in the book because it's it, it's something that more people need to be thinking about, about how they think when they think about energy, to use marginal analysis to understand uh, the economics of energy on the one hand. And then on the other hand, from an analytical uh, perspective, I think understanding the economics of energy is very useful to understanding economics in general, uh, particularly in the modern world today, because uh, we... If you really want to understand the importance of the Industrial Revolution and the significance of the Industrial Revolution over time, I think the most powerful way of explaining it is that it caused a massive increase in human productivity uh, because it allowed us to access very large amounts of energy at our fingertips. In other words, the average human being before industrialization had access to roughly around one human's energy output or one human's power per day. You, this, this was the amount of energy that you could dedicate towards meeting your needs before industrialization. If you happen to be a king or a slave owner, then you had a few slaves or many slaves. So you'd have, say, a hundred people dedicating their energy and power toward you. They could chop trees for you to keep you warm in the winter. They could burn those uh, logs to heat up water so you could have a hot shower. And you only managed to have these incredible luxuries if you had slaves, dozens of slaves who have, were working for you. Well, industrialization today makes it so that the average American has something like the total energy consumption of 200 people at their disposal every day. When you think about the energy that goes into heating your water, heating your house, driving your car around, it's like having 200 slaves at your disposal every day. But of course, it's not really comparable because your car is faster than any car that can be pushed by slaves. 10,000 slaves won't make your car travel faster than uh, an engine. So what energy has given us is really best understood um, when you think of it about it in economic terms. And what industrialization has given us is best understood when you think about it in energy terms. Now, on the issue of energy and power, I really think it's, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a shift in vocabulary, but it's also very, very significant toward understanding how energy markets work. So a lot of people think of energy in terms of just the aggregate number of joules that are being deployed. And so you'll hear a lot of discussion about 
well, this is, um, you know, this this energy source can provide this many joules, and that energy source can provide that many joules, and so the, we can meet our needs from energy with these two sources. But I believe this is not a useful way of thinking about it. It's um, an aggregate measure, and it's not a marginal uh, approach. The correct approach to economics is marginal economics, in which you think about the next unit. You analyze things in terms of the next unit. And so the marginal value of energy is not is different from the aggregate total value of energy. We don't really need overall energy. Um, we don't really need uh, the total aggregate amount of energy. So the best way of thinking of this is sunlight. Sunlight, uh, on any given day, more energy f hits the sun than all humanity consumes in a year. Solar energy is so plentiful in a way that we cannot even uh, think about consuming. So all of the energy that all of humanity consumes in a year is less than the energy that hits the sun in a day, that hits the earth in a day. So some people will say, well, this is obviously why we should all move towards solar energy, because it's just so plentiful. But that's not the economic way of thinking, because that's, again, thinking in aggregates. And um, I urge people to read in the book the example of the water and diamond, thinking about why is it that water is so much cheaper than diamonds when water is essential, but as diamonds are not. If you understand that, you understand marginal analysis. And if you understand that, you understand why it makes no sense to talk about the total amount of solar energy hitting Earth versus the total amount of energy that we consume. Because we don't consume energy in the aggregate. We never have to choose between the total energy produced by solar power versus the total energy produced by hydroelectric or hydrocarbons or uh, nuclear power. We are always making energy choices at the margin. And specifically, we make our choices in terms of power. We don't just get energy, we get energy over units of time. That's what does things. That's what moves things around. That's what heats our water. That's what moves our cars. That's what does all the things that we want. That's what keeps our refrigerators running. You need a certain amount of energy per unit of time. And so it's a marginal um, approach to energy that keeps our machines running. And it's a marginal approach that helps us understand it. So what is it? Uh, what is it? Why is it that water is cheaper than diamonds? The reason is nobody has ever faced the choice, as far as I can tell. Nobody's ever been put in a situation where they're told, "How much will you pay for diamonds for the rest of your life, and how much would you pay for water for the rest of your life?" That's just not a choice that's ever been given to anybody. Nobody has to make the choice between diamonds in the abstract or diamonds in the aggregate versus um, water in the abstract or water in the aggregate. You're constantly making choices about the next sip of water and the next carrot of diamond that you're buying. That's it. And so therefore, the reason water is so much cheaper than diamonds is that at the margin, at any particular point where anybody is making decisions to purchase water in a modern civilized society, if you live in a civilized society, if you live in a city, that city was built in a place near water sources, and so water must be very abundant. And so you live in a world in which you um, had a shower in fresh water in the morning, drank water all day, and now you are in, uh, you, you're contemplating whether you're going to have another sip, of, another cup of water um, after lunch or no. And so you consider whether you're going to buy it or not. And so the value, the marginal value of that extra marginal cup of water, given that you've had a lot of water all day, all week, all month, all year, is tiny. And so it's not that valuable. You, and we, as long as we continue to live in places where water is abundant, we are able to pay small prices for water. And the marginal value of the next sip of water is not very high for us. If, on the other hand, you were on a desert island and you'd spent a week with no water, well, now you're living in a situation where the next marginal unit of water is extremely valuable for you. And in that situation, you'd pay for it more than you would pay for a diamond. But that's not the common case for most people's lives where we are surrounded by plentiful water, but rare diamonds. So the reason that diamonds are more expensive is that you are 
when you're considering buying a diamond for the vast majority of people buying a diamond they're usually only buying their first diamond and maybe for most people it's the last um and so the marginal benefit of having one diamond over zero diamond is huge or one carat of diamond over zero carats of diamond is huge a uh, marginal benefit whereas the marginal benefit of having your one thousandth cup of water in, a, in this year versus having the one thousand and one cup of water is just not that huge it's not going to make that huge of a difference so at the margin you can understand why the valuations differ so much if you were given the choice between them in the aggregate then yeah you would choose water that would make water more expensive in the aggregate than diamonds but you never have that choice so taking this back to energy if you apply the same framework to thinking about energy you'll see why it's misleading to think about aggregates and think about things like well there's so much solar so clearly we should shift to solar because what matters is at the margin and at the margin solar energy that is abundant can't be easily converted into high power which is what you want so yeah there's a lot of solar energy hitting your house and your backyard but converting that to oomph in your car engine or converting that to hot water is not a trivial issue that's uh, something that requires very heavy sophisticated machinery that requires extremely sophisticated and energy intensive production in order to make it you need to burn a lot of coal to make solar panels and you need to burn a lot of oils and uh, hydrocarbons in order to produce the raw materials that go into this stuff and in order to produce the final outputs and so that's the question then it's not about the total aggregates it's about the power and that helps us understand why hydrocarbon energy is so extremely valuable and why it's not going to be um, stopped anytime soon humans are going to value hydrocarbons a lot precisely because they allow us to get high power at the margin when we want it wherever we want it so you just need to move a little bit of gasoline in a tank and a small engine and then you can run an entire house and have electricity for the whole thing on demand irrespective of the weather irrespective of anything you get a very high amount of energy in small units of time from a very mobile source of energy which is an engine and the um, oil that comes with it and that's what makes it so valuable because in these times and moments when it's really cold and there's no sunshine and there's no wind blowing and you need a lot of energy in order to stay warm at these times it doesn't matter how much solar energy falls on earth at the aggregate you're going to freeze to death and there's no way that you can cash in and say hey um listen there's a lot of solar energy hitting the pacific ocean right now um if you could just please uh, give me some of that to keep me and my kids warm tonight then we make it through the night it's not gonna happen you'll freeze to death so what you need is a situation where um, you're able to have the high amounts of energy in a short period of time at the margin for the next unit you want to have that high amount of power and that's why we invest so much in hydrocarbon infrastructure and that's why i don't see hydrocarbons going away anytime soon well um the the energy one is very interesting and uh, and and your um summation of marginal um you know value right like uh determining the value being determined and the being determined by marginal use um that that's a very important economic concept as well um and it is it is uh something that i think everyone should learn i wanted to ask you um who are you hoping to reach with this book and um and are there um other resources for learning this material maybe in a more classroom-like setting and so on and what follow-ups do you have um to this book if any that uh that you got planned well uh the audience i think is pretty much anybody uh, i think everybody mm -hmm. could benefit from learning uh these concepts about economics i genuinely think this is a very good use of anybody's uh, time uh it's mm -hmm. 10 12 hours to finish reading the book and i think it's um uh, 
it's going to give you a lot of very useful ideas that will uh, help you in life and in business thinking about time preference thinking about how you economize time thinking about the concept of capital understanding why trade is important understanding why you shouldn't be uh, initiating aggression against other people understanding why civilization is so good learning how to be a civilized human being um, and motivating that decision i'm not going to teach you how to become a civilized human being but i'm going to tell you why it matters so i think the whole thing is important and very useful if we lived in a sane world where university was not a scam i think this is the kind of economics that people would be learning at a university but we don't so i'm having to build the world that i'd like to live in and i'm doing that on my website so i teach this course on my website so if you like something more of a classroom experience where we go over this in the setting similar to the university join my website as a member safeadeen.com and then every two weeks i'm making a new lecture where a new video lecture where you get it it's a video of me and then my notes as i walk through the notes and explain the chapter and then uh once a week uh, so twice for every lecture we have two seminars where we have interactive discussions of these uh, topics and concepts so you can have the you you can recreate the university classroom experience and it's open for anybody you don't have to be at a university and it's not really um um it's it's uh, th th there's no uh, there's no admission criteria anybody can take the course and i believe anybody can learn from it and um i think with time you know my plan is to just uh, um, make good work and let the world uh, figure it out so my marketing strategy is just uh, put it out there and um, let the product advertise itself have people tell each other that they like it and i think uh, hopefully more and more people will read it and i think uh, my my kind of really optimistic scenario about this is that without um without the um without the sponsorship of fiat institutions without research grants from governments or without any of that stuff this book will hopefully establish itself as a um, better uh, way of learning about economics than the usual keynesian textbooks that they teach at university written by uh, lunatics like paul krugman and paul samuels and um because with these books you know, yeah they get assigned at the universities and all the universities buy them in enormous quantities to give to their students and they sell them at exorbitant prices i realize this is what i'm up against but at the end of the day everybody who learns those books leaves them thinking what was this weird nonsense why did i waste <laughs> my time and so very few people recommend these books for others to read them very few people graduate from university and then say to their friend you know you should really pick up that uh man q textbook and learn uh, about how he explains economics but um and the result and you can see this on something like amazon i think um having published a book i've looked pretty closely over the past over the past five six years over the amazon um sales rankings and the bestsellers lists and, and the reviews and i think it's really telling that these supposedly highly successful books don't get a lot of reviews they don't get a lot of people going in and reviewing so yeah they sell millions of copies because millions of uh, students are forced to buy this nonsense by their university but very few of those students then log on to amazon to write a review about the textbook because it was just something they had to do to get the grade so uh, on the other hand you know something like the bitcoin standard had uh, has got so far something like 6800 reviews or something so i hope that by establishing this um by having a good readership that appreciates this and they like the book they'll start reviewing it more and more they'll tell people more and more about it in a few years it's going to hopefully outpace um uh, in terms of rankings and reviews it'll uh, it'll, it'll overtake most of the regular um, mainstream textbooks on economics and then it'll become more of a real uh, resource that people go to to learn about economics so yeah do the manku krugman nonsense so you can pass but then when you really want to learn how the world works <laughs> go to the safe Gene special yeah well i i would love to see you write more of this stuff i i would love to see a whole book on the um 
sort of like an Austrian analysis of time and uh, and going deeper into how that relates to scarcity and economics in general. I would love to see another book on uh, the energy thing that you, you talked about in the book. I think there's uh, the marginal analysis that uh, that you laid out was uh, significantly like that that that's really important and I, I i do feel like that isn't um really well understood uh or analyzed uh that deeply especially uh among the austrian school and so on so i i would love to see more of that and uh i i hopefully you write some follow-up books to um you know uh help people like me to understand these topics in a deeper way so um really appreciate the book really enjoyed the book um and you know like a lot of textbooks are kind of boring to read i i i found yours very easy to read very um like it, it's dense in the sense that there's a lot of ideas in there but it's not anything that takes like like hours to understand like a concept or anything like that it's laid out very easily and readably and you know um is, so in that sense i think it's very different than your typical textbook in that it's actually like kind of readable. And, you know, I, I, I just like read it before I go, went to sleep, just like a few pages every day. And it was, uh, and I got through it fairly fast. It, it was, um, it, it, it was an enjoyable read. So anyway, I, I wanted to thank you for the book and hopefully the people that watch this interview, uh, if they don't have it already are motivated enough to go and check it out and uh and you know encourage others to go look at it if they already have thank you so much there yeah i um i've been told that um several people told me calling it a textbook uh undersells it because a lot of people uh won't uh, want to read the textbook when it really is it, it is like the bitcoin standard and the fiat standard it's closer to that as a style of writing and reading than uh than, than a textbook but uh yeah, I guess uh, uh, pe people are just going to have to make the jump, <laughs> take the leap, and uh, get into it. Uh, you may find the first chapter a little bit uh, tedious because it's talking about human action and why human action um, mm -hmm. can be a little bit tedious, but stick through it. The fun stuff gets uh, started very quickly, and then you'll uh, you you'll find it enjoyable, I think. I hope. Please, Jimmy recommends it, so. <laughs> can't be too wrong <laughs> alright well thanks safety thank you man take care bye bye